well okay uh, i hope you are able to see the word file and you are able to see me as well yes somebody please reply yes sir well okay fine yes sir right okay <clears throat> So today's topic we are going to discuss is that is external and internal criticism. See, we I think uh, so far we have studied about how the data is to be collected, how the information is to be gathered that is required for your uh, research. Uh, but whatever data that we come across or whatever book or whatever material uh, that we come across, it is not necessary that all of it uh, is uh, important for our research. Uh, and there are certain texts, there are certain books, which uh, the importance of those texts will vary. Like some of the texts will be will be very very important, uh, and some of the texts uh, will not be that important. So we need to uh, subject those texts. We need to subject those resources to the criticism. Criticism does not mean that we are going to criticize it. The criticism means we are going to engage with that text in such a way so that. First thing we will be verifying is that whether the that text that source is useful to us. That is the first thing. If it is useful, next stage is that how far that is useful. So the first stage is called external criticism. That is we are trying to understand if that text that source is useful for us. And the second one is called internal criticism. It's like you know in a in a very simple Sheikh Ali's book he gives a very simple example. It's like receiving a letter. Later in an envelope. So first thing that we do is that we check if the envelope is addressed to us. Second thing is that we check from whom it came. So if the letter really belonged to us and it came from whom it came that also we see and after that we open it and we try to read it and we try to understand it. Uh, the criticism of the text is having a very similar pattern. We try to understand if the text is useful for us. Who has written the text? Is it authentic? It is. It should not happen that. Uh, just a minute. It should not uh, happen that. Uh, just uh, because somebody comes and tells you that this is a text uh, written by a contemporary of Chhatrapati Shivaji, and we just start accept it as a fact and start uh, using those those texts for our research. We need to really identify and authenticate whether the text uh, is really written by someone who has worked with Chhatrapati Shivaji. Uh, when we evaluate all these things, that is called external criticism. So in the external criticism, re re external criticism is also called lower criticism because it is a very simple kind of criticism. It is an internal criticism which is called higher criticism. Well, now, In case of this external criticism, which is lower criticism, and it is also called her heuristics. Uh, it is a bit a difficult word to pronounce. Even if you don't remember it, it's fine. But I think I should introduce you to this. Uh, it is called heuristics. And the internal criticism is called hermeneutics. Heuristics and hermeneutics. So heuristics is an external criticism. It is also known as lower criticism. It is also known as external criticism. It's like trying to identify whether the letter belongs to us. So what, what does we check? Whether the text is authentic, it is not a fraud text, it is not a text which is uh, uh, prepared by somebody else and name is given by some ancient person, some old, uh, some, some person, some historical figure. Uh, we try to understand uh, what place and during which period it was written, uh, whether the text is related to our research, uh, does the, you know, and how to verify if the letter is authentic, it, it is quite an... A tedious task. It's quite possible that I may not understand the language of uh, uh, 17th century Marathi. I may not understand the Modi. You know, this is 17th century, the political correspondence of the Marathas used to be written in the Modi script. So in that case, I may have to take the help of the expert uh, paleographers who understand the language. And uh, well, <coughs> what is the reason that the people uh, create uh, the false document? Somebody writes the document now and says that this is the document of 100 years old. People temper with the document, people create false document because 
they have some vested interest they want to want to enhance the prestige of their own family or they want to become popular by by claiming that they have found something which is very important historical document uh, or they have some personal rivalry so they want to you know uh, defame uh, some particular family with all these purpose uh, people create a false document and when we uh, do external criticism or when we do her heuristics or when we do lower criticism, we need to uh, verify all those things, whether the text is authentic, written by the really the person as claim in the document. And for that, you need to take the help of the expert. For example, there will be expert who understand the writing of, let us say, Nana Fadanvis, who will understand the writing of Moropan, who will understand, understand the writing of Ramchandra Panta Amatya. And uh, they will identify that this is uh, true or false, right? So excellent criticism is done now. Uh, we have identified that the text is authentic. We have identified the author. Uh, we have identified that the text is useful for our research. For example, text might be authentic, but it has nothing to do with our research. For example, if you are doing, let us say, uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture practices in the 17th century Maharashtra, and uh, we come across a document uh, that is related to Punjab, and have nothing to do with Maharashtra. That document may be authentic, but then it, it is of no value to you. And you, you may have to just discard it or, or give it to somebody who is interested into that kind of research. So this is what we do in the external criticism. Now let us go to the internal criticism. Internal criticism, as I said earlier, it is also known as hermeneutics. It is also known as higher criticism because here you need to have a deeper, uh, more uh, serious engagement uh, with, with the text and what uh, we do in internal criticism what we do in hermeneutics in hermeneutics also there are two types of uh, evaluation we do two types of criticism or two types of engagement that we do that is an affirmative evaluation and negative evaluation now what is the meaning of affirmative evaluation affirmation means something that is positive something you say yes affirmative means yes so affirmative means straight away we you are trying to understand what the author is trying to tell you so in affirmative evaluation you try to take a peep into the author's mind we need to understand uh, uh, I I interpret what he has written and for that you really need to have a uh, proficiency of the language for example when i interpret mahabharata i have to mostly use the translated text it is advisable it is expected that uh, the uh, the scholar should know uh, the the language in which the text is written so you need to be careful in interpretation uh, deciphering the hidden meaning you know there is uh, there are there are so, so, so sometimes the meaning is hidden um, and we need to understand in what context with what intention the author has written and it is called alleg allegorical language for example uh, there is an allegory of uh, Mother India, which became very popular during the uh, anti-colonial struggle. Now, Mother India, in fact, it is in the imagination that there is mother has to be a woman and there is no woman uh, that you can show somebody. This is Mother India, uh, which has given, you know, birth to her children. Uh, it is in the imagination. So it is an allegory we need to understand. Now, if somebody just try to interpret it in the, the literary meaning and try to go in search of a woman, in search of a lady who, who can be called Mother India, it, it is he is not understanding in, in what context that word is being spoken. Similarly, there are certain words which communicate meaning. For example, uh, it was said about uh, Indira Gandhi that she was the only man in the cabinet. Now, we know that Indira Gandhi was a woman, but if somebody who doesn't know this, uh, Indira is a name of a woman, somebody who came from far off land, maybe from Africa and is not familiar with, with, with the Indian uh, or the English way of speaking. Uh, and he have a very less knowledge of English. If, if he, he hears this sentence, Indira Gandhi was the only man in the cabinet. So what, how he will take the literary meaning and how he will interpret it? He will interpret that in the cabinet of Indira Gandhi, Indira Gandhi was the only man and rest everybody, the cabinet minister were women. Is it the right interpretation? The purpose, the, what, the only man in the cabinet, Indira Gandhi was the only man in the cabinet, what it tries to communicate is that she used to hold all the power in her hand. And like a man of the house takes all the decision and doesn't listen to anybody and the woman of the house generally has to obey him, you know, in a patriarchal society. I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody, neither to women, neither to the men. But it is just I'm trying to explain in what 
the sentence Indira Gandhi was the only man in the cabinet tries to communicate is that she was holding all the power in her hand and nobody had guts, nobody had courage to 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 speak anything uh, against uh, her uh, to to disagree with her. Uh, similarly, literary meaning and actual meaning, uh, you know, you you need to understand this thing also. For example, Karl Karl Marx will be studying about Karl Marx. Karl Marx says that the state will wither away. So what does he mean by that? That existence of state is there because there is an inequality. And it is for the protection of uh, the, the rich people that we need police, we need judiciary. Suppose, according to Karl Marx, I don't agree with him, according to Karl Marx, if there is an equality, if everybody is having, having equal wealth, there will be no crime. And uh, there will be no need of, the state will wither away. What does that mean is that the amount of resources that we spend in maintaining discipline, the amount of money that we spend in uh, maintaining police forces and judiciary will not be required. But some resemblance of state will be there, some constitution has to be there. So we should not just take the lit lit literary meaning. For example, uh, just before exam, I have studied everything. I have studied everything means almost I have finished. But still just before the exam, we, we, we do study. So there is a difference between the literary meaning and actual meaning. And we need to understand it. This, this is what is what comes in the internal affirmative evaluation. Uh, one word can have a different meaning. For example, when you go to the market, when you purchase something, let us say you purchase some medicine and then you ask for a bill. You purchase grocery, the grocery shop owner will give you the bill. Now here the bill is something that is a receipt of the money you have paid. But the bill is presented in the parliament. Here the meaning of the bill changes. Here in case of the parliament, the bill is rough draft on which there will be discussion and the law will be made. So the, the, though the word is same, the meaning goes on, on changing uh, depending on, on the context. Uh, all right, depending on, for example, mouse, let us say mouse. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, the mouse means immediately what, come, what comes to my mind, what, what used to come to my mind is that the mouse that we see in the, in the house, the small animal. But now if you say the word mouse, I think, I am sure nearly 90% of the person uh, will think about this mouse. That is a mouse that is attached to the computer because this is what mostly we come across in our day-to-day uh, -day life. So though the word is same, we just like if some, somebody says, uh, I'm going to buy a mouse uh, from Amazon. If you really don't know that this is also a mouse, somebody who has not seen the computer will interpret, oh, oh animals are being sold on, the, on, on Amazon. That is how they will interpret. So it is a misinterpretation. So we need to understand uh, in what context the particular word is used. And uh, next in uh, affirmative internal evaluation, what we do is that if there is any distortion in the text while copying, you know, the co the text used to be copied by hand. There were no printing press earlier, no Xeroxing machine, no photocopying machine. So uh, if there is any distortion while uh, copying. So all this is done in the affirmative evaluation. Now let us go to the next part of the internal evaluation that is negative evaluation. And main purpose of this negative evaluation uh, to eliminate uh, the possibility of error. And this starts with distrust. For example, if you have received a letter, you have done the external evaluation, that means you have identified uh, the, uh, the, uh, the person who wrote the letter, it is addressed to you. Now you have read the letter and you have done the affirmation. Oh, well, okay. This person mm, is uh, my friend of mine who has written a letter to me after a long gap. Well, very good. He, he still remembers me. He is uh, my childhood friend. And then he, through his letter, he writes that he is in a deep trouble and he, he is expecting a help from the old friend and all that. Now you understood that he is in a, a deep trouble. So that is a positive evaluation. Now negative evaluation is that you will start doubting, well, okay, this person, this fellow, since last 10 years, he has not written any letter to me. When I was in need of help, he turned his back to me. And now this fellow is trying to uh, ask help from me. Does he need some money or the, is it is it right for me? So, you know, when you start with a mistrust, then that is what is called negative evaluation. And negative evaluation is very, very, very important. Uh, in negative evaluation, we start understand the psychology of the author. What is the psychology? Is he a person? who always try to use somebody or is he an author who is 
paid by the king so he writes in favor of the king or is he a author who is bias against somebody for example if i am i belong to one particular religion it's quite possible that i may not have a very favorable opinion about the people of another religion and i might be biased so i'll just point out the negative thing it's quite possible that i am i belong to one particular region and i may be biased against the people of some other region and i may write against them so you know we need to understand when we try to understand it and evaluate all this thing that is coming under the negative evaluation which is a part of the internal criticism you can call it a negative internal criticism and earlier was positive internal criticism this is called negative internal criticism so we have to write whether the writing is politically motivated whether the writer was biased now error done due to good faith and error of accuracy uh, this i will explain to you some more in detail after this let me just cover up all the points first author's bent of mind we need to understand the author's bent of mind it is quite possible that you know some people they are having a poetic bent of mind kavi ki tarah unka man hota hai and when you have that kind of poetic bent of mind and if you are writing history book jahan par bhi aapko chance milega aap description doge nature ka because that is your habit but it is quite possible that administrative detail aapko bore karenge administrative detail ka aap zyada acche se uh you you may not you may not give a uh, very detail and very authentic information of the administrative structure but you may describe uh, the things in in a, in a poetic manner it's quite possible that at one place you might be active at one place you might be lazy so you know we need to understand the author's bent of mind somebody might be influenced by some particular ideology for example marxism was very prominent ideology that has influenced the history writing to so, marxism se aap bahut jyada agar prabhavit hai if you are too much under the influence of the marxism it's quite possible that you may ignore the different angle and give lot of importance to what marxist perspective says i i'm just giving an example it it could be varied uh, different different kind of uh, uh, ideological influence would be there on on your mind and which will make you or make a historian to look at historical facts from a particular perspective uh if there is any physical deformity if the person has become very old and we get information that he 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 has his eyesight has become weak then in that case his observations may not be very good so all that things comes in the negative evolution and this uh, two points i will i'll discuss in little bit error a little bit uh, detail that is error of good faith you know sometimes the person who writes an account of the event he makes an error due to certain good faith now what does that mean for example abul fazal he was devotee of akbar uh, because akbar has kept him in his court and he used to shower a very high praise on akbar akbar ne jo bhi kiya hai uske bare mein usne bahut akbar ki prashansa ki hai he has uh, showered uh, akbar with, with praises so you know he had a vested interest because he was employed by akbar and he was under obligation so that with the uh, good faith towards akbar he could have made certain error whatever the defects of akbar uh, whatever the defects akbar had or what are the mistakes that akbar had done probably he will not write it but only write about his good points sometimes the people are afraid of public opinion and they hide uh, from uh, speaking the truth uh, and uh, they they write something uh, that we should not you know uh, Mm, arose the public opinion for example recently uh, what is happening there are there are some trouble in in uh, amravati and in akola and in nanded uh, but there will be many people many reporter who will not bring out who will not come out with all the facts because they are afraid that or even the government will not come out with the, all the facts because they are afraid that it may create some more problem in the in, in the population so their intention is good that peace should be prevailed but with that good intention what is compromised is truth and the student of history should be always aware that with this good intention there could be certain error personal prejudice for example there are different opinion about robert clive somebody says that from the britishers says that he was an architect of british empire in india from indian perspective he was an imperialist so prejudice britishers they praise him indians they criticize him Humility. Sometimes you know some people have an arrogance, intellectual arrogance. They think that they know everything and they understand anything. And we, in that arrogance, in that vanity, they end up uh, giving a mistake. For example, if I don't know anything about, let us say, agriculture, 
but I, I want to write a book on uh, historical agriculture practices. So in that case, I should take the help of somebody who is an expert on agriculture. I should ask him about the details, different crops pattern, what are the different diseases that, that the crops are facing and what is the name of all, all those things. And But if I am too arrogant or if I feel that I am the only smart person, I may not take the help of anybody and finally my account will be faulty. Uh, then the, there is something called patriotic error. Patriotic error, what does that mean? For example, if I am an historian from India and if I had to write the history of the wars between India and Pakistan, my mind is most likely to be prejudiced against Pakistan because since childhood we, we keep on hearing that Pakistan is enemy country, Pakistan is enemy country. And in the history of that war, I will always uh, have inclination to praise the Indian soldiers and uh, to, to demean uh, the Pakistani soldier and uh, proclaim that India had been victorious and the war had in fact always started by Pakistan. You know, that kind of attitude will influence my mind and I may not be able to do justice to the topic. And Pakistani historian may most probably do this thing, a similar thing. He will say oh, Pakistan is the great country, so on and so forth. So, this is called patriotic error. It's because of your mind is influenced by the patriotic ideas, patriotism, the love for your country. And that is the reason you are not going to say a single word, anything that might tarnish the image of your country. But you will uh, pick up only those things uh, that, uh, that will enhance the image of your own country. That is called patriotic error. Now, next uh, error that is most likely to occur in the internal negative evolution that, that is that is most likely to occur while writing text book or while writing an account and which need to be taken into consideration when we do the internal negative evolution that is error of accuracy for example the longer the topic is or the border the area of research is the error of accuracy is bound to be more for example if you have to write the history of two years that you have spent in the department of history. There might be some error definitely, but the error are likely to be on the lesser side because you are having a very small area to cover. You come to the department, observe the department, observe the teacher, observe your, uh, your, your classmates um, and then you write an, your account. But if I ask you to write the history of these two years of the complete RTM Nagpur University, your canvas is becoming very bigger. You have to think about all the faculties. Out of those faculties, you have to select the important faculties. You have to think about all the academic activities that is happening in all the departments. And out of that, you may have to select the important. You have to, you have to, you have to think about the administrative structure. You have to think about the progress. You have to think about the research projects. And your task is going to be very big task. And the bigger the task is, the error are the, the likelihood, the possibility of error also, all, are also on the higher side. So this is called error of accuracy. The bigger the topic is, the higher the error of accuracy will be. I mean, you will not be very uh, accurate uh, in describing. And that is that is what happened. And uh, that, that, that is what happened uh, when you cover the bigger topic. Let us say Russian revolution. Russia is such a huge country. And the revolution, it continued for months together. Uh, and somebody wants to write an account of the Russian revolution. He has to cover such a vast area. And obviously, the error of accuracy will be on the lesser side. Um, uh, on, on the more side, there are more likely to be uh, error. Uh, similarly, let us say Queen India movement 1942. It spread with such a huge area, India. India is almost like a continent. And uh, it's very very difficult uh, to, to, to know precisely what is happening at every places. The person might be there at Bombay, but what is happening in Kolkata, he has to rely on somebody's account and there could be an error. The more, uh, the larger area is, the more uh, bigger time span is. For example, if you are, you are trying to uh, um, write the history of Marathas from, uh, let us say, uh, 13th century to 18th century, so it's, it's a very huge period and the error of accuracy is likely to be more. So when the error of accuracy is more, when the uh, event covered is too big, uh, did the author verify his information? That also you have to check if you want to check how far is the error of accuracy 
uh, situation what are the situation under which the author has made his observation it's quite possible that the author might have been captured and then his observation is not likely to be very reliable it's quite possible that author has been wounded in the war and uh, he himself might be participating in the war so you know all those things cloud uh, uh, the accuracy affect uh, the accuracy uh, does the author have a tendency to exaggerate exaggerate uh, uh, does does he uh, do the exaggeration so that is also another another problem uh, then there could be a prejudice for example james mill was prejudiced against the indian so when he wrote history of british india he wrote that indian people were backwards so on and so forth uh, karl marx he looks at history